Well, I hope you're all envious. Um, I mean, that's quite the career, okay? And uh, it's really fabulous to hear you touch on various dimensions of what the office was up to. I uh, want to break some, uh, I want to give you some breaking news if you haven't, uh, if you don't know about it. Uh, oh, God. They, um, this has been videotaped, uh, as, you, as you may have seen. Uh, that tape is going into the office of the uh, Minister of Science uh, here uh, as she contemplates uh, what to do about a uh, new chief science advisor uh, here in the federal government. Um, also, the other breaking news, of course, is that uh, I think Kay is uh, one of the applicants, aren't you, Kay? Uh, <laughs> sorry. No. Anyway, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, no. Okay. Anyway, uh, thank you for that great talk. Uh, let me just make a couple of comments, and then I want to open it up to Q's and A's for uh, again KTC. Let's see what I do. Um, on that chart, that last very complex, one of the last complex charts that Kay put up uh, from Arimoto, which showed this incredible system of vice, right? There was a little bubble on the top that said Carnegie Group G7 plus five. Uh, the reason I mentioned that, because that was a club of science ministers and science advisors that was created by Bill Golden William Golden, who was former advisor to Harry and Truman, and Alan Brown. Uh, they both got together and they said, wouldn't it be nice if we got the science advisors and science ministers of the G8 at the time uh, together and chat about stuff that we should be wary of that's coming up on our mutual agendas, stuff that we can talk informally about. They were held on weekends. <clears throat> on isolated but somewhat exotic places. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were as a captive audience, no staff, no media, no press releases. And the idea was to get the science ministers and advisors to get to know each other, and therefore, after the meeting, pick up the phone and say, hey, let's get together, we got a particular crisis here, a particular issue we have to deal with, etc., etc." So I, I had the privilege of going on a number of those meetings with uh, a number of our science ministers at the time, science advisor when we had one and uh, we went to uh, these very interesting locales and we discussed emerging issues like cybersecurity, um, uh, chemical and other uh, nasty things that were uh, taking place around the globe and a large part of this was a function of this vision that Ellen Bromley had uh, with Bill Golden. Uh, I just wanted to mention that because this is the Bromley lecture I want to remind people about probably who, by the way, was born 150 clicks west of here, right, near Pembroke, and uh, worked at Chalk River uh, in physics. I was a tremendous supporter of Canada-US science relations and did enormous uh, advocacy for that relationship. Um, you know, I see Walter Davidson here. He was a tremendous supporter of snow and Margaret would know about this, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, Triumph, Sean Lee's here, um, and uh, promoted the fact that Canada and the US have this incredible invisible border when it comes to the transfer of knowledge, and that we should profit from it in a much more sophisticated and systematic way. So, um, you know, uh, Alan was, and I had occasion, of course, and privilege to meet with Alan, along with uh, his, his uh, uh, other science advisors that followed Jack, Jack Hibbett, Marburger, etc. A really interesting bunch of, of, of individuals who, who really wanted to make a difference, as, as Kay has said. Uh, I'm very glad that Kay's mentioned the science integrity question. It's a question that is still here. It's creeping up uh, in, uh, in the U.S. In, in a big way right now. Uh, but it's an issue that we've had to deal with here in Canada. I'm also glad he mentioned targets for R&D. Mm -hmm. Canada's had its challenges. We've tried that, mm -hmm. didn't it? Done that. Um, he's also mentioned, of course, uh, a lot of the work that they did around the issue of science diplomacy and in international, in other areas, which I think was very helpful. So, Kay, I want to thank you for uh, for that. Um, last point with Alan Bromley. One of the fascinating things he did while he was advisor to the U.S. president was he produced 
a series of documents in very succinct topic areas that he felt the United States should work on and exploit, not just for American leadership, but for global leadership. So for example, he produced a really interesting document around mega projects for science, uh, which of course included working with other countries and developing guidelines for how you can work with countries around some of these issues, et cetera. Uh, he did one on science and education. He did one on uh, the whole issue of high performance computing. Uh, and he was in many ways ahead of his time, thinking ahead of what's coming forward. And he had some really interesting things to say about China. And the emergence in 19, you know, 1992, 93, they were, they were, the, people were just thinking about how where China was getting on the radar in this area and what was going on. Um, so, you know, uh, Nicholas mentioned uh, this very interesting paper by Alan Bromley uh, in 2004 where he talked about the uh, rise of China and the, the issues it will pose for everybody. Uh, in the area of science, technology, and innovation. It's very pressing in that way. Mark Sanner. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for um, a really interesting talk and very timely for Canada. Now, you used a bunch of metaphors, deep sport, contact sports, uh -huh. uh, geo-leading, and so on. I really emphasized how um, competitive the marketplace for attention is. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't imagine another model, maybe theoretical model, where things are a bit more planned. Where it's not just who has the best event and the greatest uh, idea to get the attention, but where the very complex world we live in is thought through more systematically and there's a plan that gets the buy-in from, from everyone that counts. Mm -hmm. So maybe not so much a Darwinistic system, but a more, I don't know how to call it, but uh, Lamarckian or even Soviet system, if you like, I think it's more fun. But do you think of that possibility? Could that work? Um, I don't think it would work in the United States because I think you you just hit on some political red buttons uh, in what you've just said. Soviet one planned. Uh, um, so in a political context, uh, I don't think that's going to work. And also on a practical level, you may have noticed that well. United States government does not do planning very well, or it doesn't do you know long-term horizon scanning or long-term policy very well. Uh, in a U.S. audience, I, I would say, uh, U.S. science agencies don't even know what kind of funding they'll have in May. Uh, so thinking you know five-year plans, uh, or in the EU case, knowing what how much funding you'll have in 2020 seems like this unbelievable uh, luxury to uh, the US context. So I mean, that's, you know, that's my contribution. Of course, we would love to be able to do that. I mean, I am such a fan of participatory technology assessment, these you know, consensus workshops, um, but I just don't, have not found a, a good way to try to integrate that into the US system as I know it. Thank you, Mike. Yes? Did you identify yourself, please? Hi, my name is uh, Bo Frederick, just like your dog. Uh -huh. so, um, <laughs> yeah. I work for the Environment Commission of Canada, uh -huh. and I have a, quite a specific question about okay. how the U.S. assures that research is at arm's length from the private sector. And the reason why I'm asking that mm -hmm. is I noticed that you said that two thirds of your budget mm -hmm. is from the private sector in Canada. We're increasingly dependent on the private sector for our research, mm -hmm. and uh, especially in my field, that uh, the environment it, it poses a problem because uh, sometimes research reveals um, things that the private sector does not want to hear about. Mm -hmm. So, how does the U.S. ensure that out of this two thirds of the funding coming from the private sector, that the science remains independent and apart from the private sector? Well. Um well, number one, I think, of course, the in the R and D that is funded by industry is you know not funded by the government, so that's one way to do that. And and frankly, we rely on this external to government peer review, you know, review publication and dissemination <coughs> process to be uh, the validator, the external validator. So the you know, U.S. government funds 
U.S. government, with its own resources, funds a lot of research, and it is, and including a lot of research in industry. But that is very much given out in an arm's length way through primarily grants. Grants, of course, are are much more arm's length than contracts, and you know the publication of those results is very much outside of the U.S. government's control. It is up to the, the broader U.S. science and engineering community to validate the results, to publish those results. So I think that's, and it, of course, but we want that research to come back to the government. And that's where you know questions of scientific integrity and the policies for how federal policymakers understand and utilize scientific research results that may be performed by industry come in. And again, it is primarily external uh, in that it is not government decision makers who are validating industry science, but it's uh, external advisory boards that are connected in an arm's length way to federal agencies. So that's, those are some of the strategies that we use to, uh, to make sure that um, company funded and company performed research is uh, independent, but also valid and useful for government purposes. Thank you. Peter? Hi, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. My name is Peter McKinnon. I'm associated with a couple of faculty here at the University of Ottawa. And uh, what I'd be very interested to uh, uh, ask you about is how do you deal with the legislature all over the White House, oh. and getting them to be aware of the science and technology oh. issues of the day. And I give examples because, of course, I recall I used to work with colleagues in the who was the Office of Science and Tech Technology Assessment. Uh -huh. Oh, oh yes. yes. Yeah, if you remember the yeah. rest of these. Yes. yes. <laughs> and then we have here in Canada a rather uh -huh. interesting informal process of keeping uh, you know parliamentarians aware of science and technology. We call it the Bacon and Egghead Friends Club. Yeah, it's actually it's going by the parliament. He, he's going, going tomorrow. tomorrow. He's going, going tomorrow. tomorrow. We're going tomorrow. Yeah. The students are going tomorrow. Okay. So, I was wondering, how do you deal with getting into the uh, legislatures, getting them aware right. of what's coming or what is on the table? Uh, well, I think what came through in my talk, uh, as with others, is that um, the separation of powers of this divided, this deliberately divided government. Uh, you know, uh, often, you know, from my perspective of those buildings, you know, Congress. Is, a, a, is foreign territory, and often they were the enemy, uh, literally so, uh, in most, for most of the Obama administration, because uh, President Obama was, of course, Democratic Party, and Congress was majority Republican Party. Um, so it was very adversarial. So that's, so it was, um, that said, we had to do a lot of talking with congressional staff at the staff level to make sure that um, as much as possible, the policy agenda was written into budgets and to law. Um, so again, it was um, very few of these convenings, or it was more, much more arm's length of talking on the phone through emails, exchange of documents, um, and it was continue, a matter of continually making arguments for why those funding charts that I showed were the right answer and why Congress, of course, in its power of writing budget legislation should accept everything that the administration proposed. And we are seeing that, um, and we're seeing exactly how separate uh, these branches of government are right now uh, when uh, a Republican president is very much at odds with the Republican Congress for what next year's funding for science and other matters is going to be. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Yes? Morrison, I, you, you alluded to a problem, of, it's almost a research problem, of trying to do some science or analysis to support the development of science priorities. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could expand on that and say, what do you see as being the sort of the key research gaps and the key knowledge gaps there? I think the, the key gap that we first had to get over was just the lack of data. So making this, I mean, what are the, and maybe it's also a conceptual question. As an example, if, if I had an extra million dollars that the president kind of shook loose, on what basis would I determine whether that extra million should go to biologi biological sciences or physics or astronomy? 
Um, and do we, we don't really have empirical tools to be able to do that. We have some tools within disciplines. So within astronomy, for example, we have you know, uh, decadal surveys, you know, communities of uh, astronomers getting together to rank their priorities. Even that is you know, quasi-scientific. Uh, but between disciplines, we don't have anything. And so uh, we are, so we're left with uh, very unsatisfactory data. It often came down to, well, in physics, the success rate for proposals is 23%. Astronomy is 19%. So uh, we're going to give that extra million dollars to astronomy to equalize the two. And you know, on, on a scientific basis, that makes no sense. Right? But on a political basis, it does. So I wanted more data other than success rates or average grant size, some more empirical data to be able to make a better decision of how to allocate resources. Last question, yes. Meredith. Meredith. Thank you, yeah. Meredith. Uh, Meredith very, that was a fascinating talk. Uh, he was perhaps one of the best talks, purely in science policy, that I have ever heard. And I think Paul and I always agree on that you. one. Uh, mm -hmm. Kudos to you and the ISSB. So it, it is very timely for us in Canada to hear from you to elaborate a little bit on the type of dynamic of the relationship between the, uh, the director of OSTP and the president and the cabinet in mm -hmm. terms of the, how often the director would attend the cabinet meetings, it was it by request or it was all the time or he was considered as a cabinet member, you know, he was treated like that and, and that type of relationship would be very interesting to yeah. hear. Yeah. Uh, from you, how it was and how it was received by the other members of the cabinet. Yeah, uh, the I should have brought a picture of the cabinet room. So there is a cabinet <laughs> room, um, and so John Holden, Dr. Holden, was a part of every cabinet meeting in the Obama administration. Uh, he wasn't at the table, but he had this spot like along the wall. So he had, uh, uh, so he was there in every cabinet meeting, um, and on many occasions. He was asked to actually provide, well, what does the science say about this issue that the entire cabinet was discussing? Um, and well, of course, I, I never got the room because it was a small room, but I would always <laughs> say this. I'm going to send you in with this, say that, and please report back what, what the reaction was. Um, so I mean, that is an illustration of, of the access that this uh, presidential science advisor has. And uh, if John were here, he would probably like uh, regale you with stories of, you know, last, well, last week or the last uh, month of the presidency, I was in the Oval Office like four or five times, you know. And there were times when he'd say, well, on the, the third of the three occasions last week when I was uh, talking in the Oval Office. Um, so in other words, there was a, a lot of access because there were so many topics, you know. Sometimes it would be about cybersecurity. Uh, in that one week, uh, the other one was about a meteor, meteorite strike, and then the third occasion was about pollinators. Um, so uh, that was the important, the strength of that personal relationship was very important. Um, and well, not to get too down, but you know, that one one question about this administration is uh, for well, actually for any president and that. The alchemy of having a strong personal relationship with the president, but also having the relationships and the access to the broader scientific community, that's always a really difficult uh, one to, to manage. And so, you know, it's this administration in particular will be challenged in being able to find a science advisor with that same trust from the president, but also trust by the, the U.S. science and engineering community. Uh, that, was, that was too diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, we're, we're going to have drinks after. You don't have to be diplomatic. Right, right, right. Let me, if I could just, uh, I, I just want to make a couple of quick announcements uh, while I have a captive audience here. Uh, numero uno, um, I, some colleagues are here from IDRC, the International Development Research Center, my oh. former Place. Uh, and somebody mentioned the bacon and eggheads, which is tomorrow on Parliament Hill, dining room, 7 o'clock. That is about climate change and adaptation in the yes. uh, developing world, which our colleagues from IDRC are co-hosting. So I wanted to make that announcement, and we're all going to that uh, uh, tomorrow morning, bright and early. 
an ungodly hour, but whatever. Uh, the second announcement I'd like to, to say is, uh, I noticed uh, uh, Mark, Mark Lepage is here from Genome Canada, and, uh, and uh, Alison Barr is here from the uh, Ontario government representing the Office of the Chief Scientist, duly named in Ontario government. Uh, there is an interesting report that will be released shortly uh, we were both involved, uh, all three of us actually were sort of involved in this study, and my colleagues are here from the Council of Canadian Academies. They will be releasing a report on science policy in sub-national governments on April 19th, I believe is the date. And uh, that cover, and that included, by the way, our U.S. expert on that panel. So again, Canada-U.S. relations are very strong okay, in this area. Um, and then. Uh, a uh, final uh, quick word about those who have not seen the ad yet, since Merdad got up, the Canadian Science Policy Conference is hosting a series of events, but one of which, uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks, one of which is around the March for Science, uh, which takes place on Earth Day, April 22nd. Uh, there's a panel that will be taking place here at the University of Ottawa. Uh, on April 18th at 4.30 to 6. Don't know which room, but you can look at for the posters. Science, sciencepolicy.ca, uh, thank you. Uh, Mayor Dad, appreciate that. Uh, I'll be monitoring that session with three other interesting individuals, um, uh, which, which would include, by the way, Katie Gibbs from the Evidence for Democracy, Catherine O'Hara, Carleton, University Chair of Science Journalism, and Kristen Bates, who's here at the University of Ottawa in microbiology. So it would be an interesting panel. Those of you who can, can make it uh, come and hear all about the March for Science because we heard about stuff going on in the U.S. on this. I'm sure you're fully aware of it. Uh, and the final, uh, very, very quick last comment, sorry, uh, Monica, is, uh, you know, I've got to take advantage of this speaker, uh, is that um, two of my other colleagues here, John Stone and Walter Davidson and I are working on an interesting little book project, uh, which is putting together the selected speeches and remarks of Dr. Gerhard Hertzberg with his daughter, Agnes Hertzberg, who's at Queen's University, uh, where, by the way, Alan Bromley uh, did his master's, just so you know. Uh, and and uh, we're, talk we're gonna be putting this together and uh, we're gonna give a, a talk uh, at the National Research Council Temple of Science. Uh, on April 25th, about that book. You'll see posters for that announced shortly. Avec ça, j'ai fini mes annonces, Monica, et c'est à vous de dire quelques mots. Merci. Merci, monsieur. Okay, at the outset of your remarks, you seem to question whether or not you could deliver the goods. Um, I think there's absolutely no question that uh, you delivered an exceptional talk that gave us lots. Mm -hmm. Lots to think about. I particularly liked, you know, contact sport with the library. You know, remember that? <laughs> Quite some time to come. What's in your toolkit? I think we ask ourselves at the University of Ottawa. Uh, a good deal. Excellent, uh, excellent question. The importance of time. I'm uh, thinking about science for policy and policy for science as a feedback uh, loop that really advances our thinking on on these issues. Um, you also mentioned about the importance of being in the room. And I think I can speak on behalf of everybody in this room uh, that we were very delighted that you were here with us this evening to share your remarks. I'd like to invite all of you to join me in thanking Dr. Thank